the fundamental misunderstanding of risks in your investments. Uh, right, so we're going to read this article right here by my man, Rick Bookstaber. And who Rick, Rick Bookstaber is, he had written a book, two books, matter of fact. Um, he is the author of The End of Theory and A Demon of Our Own Design. So I'm, uh, I'm looking forward. I've read this article. Uh, I had no clue who Rick Bookstaber was until my man, Michael Edisis, I uh, had, uh, had emailed him about, hey, what, what's your take on margin debt? It just seems like this, this is, uh, you know, this is a, uh, a clarion call of some sort, you know, that uh, there's too much margin debt. Eh, that's concerning to me because leverage leads to uh, high volatility. And Mike said, this is Michael, is the, uh, he's a professor, I think, like environmental mathematics in the University of Hong Kong or something like that. He goes, man, I haven't had enough time to, uh, to write on this or really study it, but read this guy, Rick Bookstaber. I said, okay. I said, if Edison tells him read Rick uh, Bookstaber, I'm reading him. So it's interesting. So uh, here he is. So it uh, looks like it's snowy back there. He needs some gloves on and a hat. Uh, advisors all know the mantra. Past performance is not indicative of future results. So why then do we think that past volatility of returns is indicative of forward risk? I, look, I completely agree with that. The world changes. It doesn't make sense, Rick says. The world changes, markets change, and for markets, a term unprecedented is commonplace. Um, I agree, agree with that. You know, basically, if you look at the at Monte Carlo, you're using a, a volatility of X, and the volatility that I use in Bright Capital is based on future uh, volatility of the S&P 500 going back to 1926. I don't know what else you could use though. Uh, you can make anything up, but that, you know, I don't use the uh, average rates of return. I think that's nuts, but I do use forward returns projected by Vanguard, which are pretty low, but I use historical volatility. I, th I think that's about the best you can do, but Rick will, will debate that in a little bit. So check this out. The common approach to measuring market risks take the last year or two of returns, computes the variability of those returns and asserts, as a, asserts that as a forward looking risk for the market. The most common metric is value at risk, VAR, but there are other methods, which he calls a uh, GARCH or an expected shortfall. I'm not familiar with GARCH and I assume I think expected shortfall. How much of the markets go down? Will you be short of what you need to retire or whatever? Whether simple or sophisticated, they all look at risk through the rear view mirror. That might be ac adequate for the humdrum, typical day-to-day -day price movements, but it's not satisfactory when risk matters, i.e. for your retirement. Look at this chart of the volatility of the S&P 500 over the last 50 years. And we go back to 1970 and notice high volatility, 1973, 74, the markets got killed. High volatility, 1982, markets got killed. High volatility, 1987, remember that? High volatility, 2001 and 2, markets got killed. High volatility, 2007, 8, 9, markets got killed. We had something in 2013. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember. Is that I can't remember, but I remember that a little bit of 2000, and then we have this one right here, uh, Q4 2018 is right there, so that seems pretty normal. But look, over the last 50 years, relatively low volatility compared to the last 20. Isn't that interesting? Volatility moves with fits and starts, unprecedented. See, I use that word, events pop up decade after decade, stagflation in the 70s, market crash of 1987. Asia crisis, a collapse of LTCM in the early beginning, the latter part of the 90s, leading up to the dot-com bubble. Uh, we had the banking crisis, credit stresses, and of course we had what we just went through. But if you estimated forward risk based on the volatility of the late 90s right here, you say, oh yeah, look at that, forward risk is gonna be a whole lot lower than what the next 20 years showed. Uh, you would underestimate your risk by a lot. And of course, it goes the other way around. If you take a period of high volatilities like the early 2000s and assume forward risk is going to look the same, you'll get it wrong. So what can we do about it? Augment whatever we're looking at in terms of historical risk with observations of the market environment. Things like leverage, things like market concentration and where we are in the credit cycle. For example, as this chart shows, we have very high concentration with the top 10 stocks of the S&P 500 accounting for more than a quarter of the index's total market cap. Eesh. A level we have seen before when banks, internet stocks, and oil dominate an earlier high volatility period. Not a great omen for risk. So here we got the internet bubble. 35% of the, uh, the S&P 500 is in the internet stocks. The banking, about 22%. Here are the FANG stocks. Eesh. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Concentration measured as a percentage of total market cap by the S&P 500. In addition, margin debt is at its highest. Margin debt versus GDP. Ugh. Look at that. And this is what got me thinking when I uh, emailed Michael. I said, man, what do you think? And he said, sent me this article. What was this written, by the way? 6-3 just the other day. Um, here we got uh, right here. Margin debt is at the highest since, I mean, look at this. 2000 margin debt was at the highest, 2007 at the highest. Yikes. Uh, margin debt is leverage. Buying asset, borrowing to buy assets, then that must be liquidated if things head south. Of course, that happens when the market is under stress, so prices are pushed down even further. Oosh. High concentration plus high leverage is a volatility, a volatile mix. And at a spark, and the result is a leverage cascade. A sudden drop in prices leads to forced selling. With high concentration, the selling overwhelms the market's liquidity and prices drop further, leading to yet more forced selling. This is exactly what happened in the, uh, the global financial crisis with the stupid mark-to-market -market accounting. You know, basically banks, pension funds, all these guys, they could not own subpar investment grade bonds. And when a bond was was when a bond was downgraded for whatever reason, because there was no buy side of that, they had to downgrade the bond, which meant more because they had to mark to market. They had to sell it when it got below a certain market value. And so what happened was they had to force liquidate, but there's no buyers to begin with. So we had no nothing on the buy side and more and more sell side, which meant that bonds just had this freaking explosion. It's crazy. So he had a bond. It's trading at 100. Now it trades at 80 because some insane you know, price movement that just you know was stupid, but it's temporary. Well, if it's mark to market, you had to sell your bond if it went below 85, if that made sense. So now you're like, oh man, well, the reason it went to 80 because there wasn't that many buyers to begin with. So now you're like, I got I buy charter of my investment policy statement, or whatever, I have to sell this. Now it's at 80, and you just throw all this new sell side on it, and now the price drops to 70 to 60. Now even more people who had to who had to sell it at 70 got to get in there. So everyone's selling, 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 selling with no buy side. Horrible. <sighs> all right, so the prices cascade down, and with the liquidity drying up, the selling moves to other markets, resulting in contagion. Because people say, "Look, I got to sell my bonds." I'm not going to price, but I still got to pay my debts. So I'm going to have to sell some other assets to pay for what I can't sell my bonds because I got debts to pay. I get margin calls and all this stuff. I got to sell my real estate. Next thing you know, that is going to contagion. And, uh, the whole thing happens. It's just it's this vicious cycle. The direction of the, con uh, the contagion often is unexpected because the link from one market to the next doesn't depend on any of the usual relationships. It isn't governed by typical correlations. It's a matter of who owns what, who owns what, and what else they own. That gets to another flaw with using history. It can be misleading for correlations. You can get a handle on these dynamics using techniques like agent-based models. I don't know what that is, but you don't need such high power methods to add this knowledge of the markets into your risk calculation. Look at the market environment qualitatively with a perspective that comes from experience. Have things changed in the past year? then risk will have change as well. 100%, and this is why I say make sure now, well, if you have, if you don't have your cash and you're close to retirement, and when I say cash, I mean like short-term bonds, cash, stable value funds, that not, the G fund if you're in the TSB, man, you better get that puppy ready because, uh, look, I mean, the, the, like I did today, sold some of my VTV, had some gains on the table. I bought uh, the Vanguard tips. I said, look, man, at the end of the day, I'm, uh, you know, I've made, you know, 25% since last year. I said, I'll take those 25%. We'll take them off the table and put them over here to protect against a market decline. And, uh, you know, that's going to happen. I don't know when, where, how, but high volatility, uh, high uh, leverage, high concentration, 13 years of a massive run, uh, unemployment. Like, I, who know, I mean, when I say unemployment, there's, the, the employment markets are nuts. Uh, who knows? Who knows? The number one thing in retirement planning is to watch your backside. Don't try to get growth at all costs. You got to watch your backside, and that's what you should be doing. All right, we'll see you.